Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Oh, you, you get quiet so quickly. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I am Tansi Whalen. I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Business here and a clinical professor for business and society. We are thrilled to have uh, CEO of Con, Con Edison, John McAvoy, who, um, while being the CEO of, of uh, Con Edison, of course, is important. Even more importantly, he's a Stern alum. So <laughs> we are thrilled to have him here with us. Um, uh, you may also, uh, you may not know that we have um, 70 uh, people from Stern working at Con Edison, and we also have 35 Con Edison employees currently en enrolled in our Langone program. So I'm proud to say that we are feeding a lot of smart people into Con Ed who, where, as you'll hear from what John has to say, they're doing really innovative and exciting things. So just a few, few words about John, and I'm going to turn over the uh, podium to him. So he oversees the company's two regu regulated utilities, Con Edison Company, as you know, uh, of New York, and Orange and Rockland Utilities. And they have about 10 million people in their service territory, so not a small outfit. Um, he, uh, Con Edison has invested more than $3 billion in their renewable energy projects through its clean energy businesses, and we'll hear a bit about, about that work. And it's, um, I bet, how many of you um, uh, think of Con Edison, Con Edison as a producer of solar energy? Oh, that's good. Good. Are you the Con Ed table? <laughs> so they are the fifth larger producer, fifth largest producer of solar energy in the country, right? Fascinating. So you'll hear a bit more about that. Um, he also oversaw the creation of Con Edison Transmission to focus on growth opportunities associated with electric transmission, gas transmission, and energy storage. So really kind of overseeing what is that transformation, that next stage, and, and we'll hear about that. Um, he's been 37 years with the company. So, uh, and, and actually when I meet people from Con Ed, um, it's, it's always fascinating to see how long they've stayed with the company. It's clearly a place that people feel loyalty to. Um, I want to also recognize here today Francis Roshensky, who has been working with us. She helped create this great panel that we did with the Energy Club uh, a, a couple of months ago on energy transformation that Con Ed was kind enough to sponsor. So thank you for being here, Francis. And finally, I, I asked, I had a short meeting with John beforehand, and I asked him, so, you know, what's some fun things I can say? And he said, well, um, uh, with, with excuses ahead of time, he's a lifelong diehard Jets fan, <laughs> and he hopes you forgive him, um, and he loves to run. He runs in the New York Marathon, um, although he was, he, he, he was quick to say he, he wasn't uh, leading the pack there, um, and, and he has three uh, lovely and wonderful daughters. So, uh, John, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to uh, both hearing from you and then having a short conversation and question and answers afterwards. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. It, it is a real um, privilege to be here at NYU, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I look forward to sharing some thoughts with you and uh, then answering questions and getting into more of a discussion. It should be uh, very interesting, hopefully, and a lot of fun. Um, I will tell you, it is a little sobering for me to think back at my days at NYU Stern. Um, it is now 30 years ago since I graduated, so when you start counting time in decades, that's very humbling. Um, and to put that into perspective that a business student could appreciate, when I started at NYU, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was below 1,000. And we had many active class discussions around, does the economy, does the market have the horsepower to break through that 1,000 barrier? And so uh, 23 times, if t times that, um, here we are in 2017. So a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I will also tell you, I, I think very fondly on my time at CERN, not only for the education, but for the values that, that we learned around how to conduct business. And I will tell you that the values we talked about then and that you still, you still um, appeal to now here at Stern are very similar to the values that we're working to put into practice at Con Edison. Things like why ethical behavior has to always come first. 
um, how encouraging a culture of diversity and inclusion really enables the company to be its best and why developing products and services that bring value to customers. And, and really, you have to look at us. We are a public service company. Um, how determining those, delivering those, those products and services can really help us to lead a successful and a sustainable future. Um, I'm sure these are themes that are familiar to you. They're pro likely covered in much, much of your classwork and some of your offline discussions and very much essential to the mission of the Stern Center for Sustainable Business. And so what I'd like to do is share with you some of the ways in which Con Edison is putting those, those ideas and concepts and objectives into practice. Um, I will tell you for a start, our view is that a sustainable uh, business truly enriches the communities in which it serves. It gives customers the services and the products that they want. It helps to reduce risk both for the company and for the customer. And it's one that can attract and keep and develop its people by encouraging an environment of diversity and inclusion. Um, I'll tell you, I always start off with safety because we manage three large, uh, the electric, gas, and steam systems in the city, which are all large energy systems, which naturally bring them with them important hazards that we have to ensure does not affect negatively our employees or the public we serve. Um, we do many things to make sure that that is our top priority. Um, I'll give you a few examples. For our employees, we've worked to dramatically reduce workplace injuries. Since 2009, we've been able to reduce them by two-thirds. And we are on our way towards working, towards achieving what we call a zero accident workplace. Um, we take that same philosophy and apply it in terms of public safety for the electric, gas, and steam system. Just one data point there, we are extremely aggressive in our response. When we hear any reports of natural gas leaks, we reach almost 90% in under 30 minutes and work to make the situation safe immediately upon arriving there. Um, that's the safety side, but I'll tell you, we also work to reduce risk by promoting an ethical culture. Um, ethical behavior is very fundamental to what we do at Con Edison because, again, we have to think of us as a public service company. That is our calling. That is the role we play. Even though we're an investor-owned utility, we are really providing an essential public service. Um, I like to think about this really on very simple terms when we talk about ethical behavior. It's about doing the right thing the right way every day. Um, the strength of our company depends on it, and frankly, I have to believe that the strength of virtually any company would depend on its employees making sure that they uphold standards. For us, that means following procedures, considering potential conflict of interest, making sure we carefully plan our work. And one thing we're very um, forthright with our employees on, if something just doesn't feel right, it's our, each of our responsibility to make sure we stand up and say something about it. Um, another risk that's very important in today's world is the risk of cyber attacks. And unfortunately, the reality is not only does it continue to increase in volume and sophistication, but for those of us in the energy business, we are increasingly targets of cyber threats. And so we work very aggressively with our industry peers at, at other energy companies, very close collaboration with government and law enforcement engine. Uh, law enforcement agencies to make sure that we're addressing this issue. And we have an extremely robust cybersecurity program to identify and protect our assets, to detect intrusions should they occur, and to be able to respond and recover should we have a significant impact. Um, we also recognize that all of our employees are a big part of this, not only because they are users but they are in many, in many ways can be the front line of defense. And so we put a tremendous amount of effort into educating our employees and making sure we have a very high level of cyber awareness. Um, I mentioned earlier bringing a variety of products and services to our customers. And we view that too as an element of sustainability. We see the customer's expectations, preferences, and needs are continuously changing. We're compared to the services that they can get from Uber and Amazon and others. And so we are working to deliver our products in a, in a more transparent, a more specific to individual customers' uh, individualization approach. And some of that includes things like providing easy access to renewables, providing um, increased resiliency from extreme weather, and providing advanced tools that allow customers to enhance and manage their own energy use. Um, 
you heard that, that we are the fifth largest solar producer in the company through our non-regulated businesses. Um, we've developed that over time um, through both developing the capability for developing renewable projects and then for in developing an investment strategy around it. Um, we've invested over $3 billion in new solar and wind projects. Um, we have large solar projects in the southwest in Texas. We have wind projects in the Midwest and then we have smaller solar projects in the Northeast. And, and as business students, um, you, you'll be interested in knowing that, and this is really pretty remarkable. Um, I'm very proud of the team. Um, we've been able to complete our large renewable projects on budget and on schedule for each one of them. And when they go into production, they make as much or more electricity than they were supposed to and as much as more earnings for the company as they were supposed to. A real win-win-win combination. Um, that, that's our solar and wind portfolio across the country. Here more locally, um, within our service territory, the demand for solar continues to increase. Our customers have over 23,000 solar installations um, that produces about 240 megawatts of energy. And um, just on the other side of the East River at the Brooklyn Navy Yard is the, is the city's largest solar project. And you can guess that we're pretty proud that it's a Con Edison project. Um, in so many aspects of our lives, we see dramatic change, again, as customers' needs and, and expectations evolve. Um, and to better serve our customers, in addition to having new products and services, we also are looking at new business models and new market interests. Um, one of those areas includes energy storage, which is a, a technology that really has huge potential and will be increasingly required as we have increased levels of intermittent renewables supplying our baseload uh, electric needs. Um, battery storage, if properly done, can also help in, uh, enhance resiliency for our customers. And we found cases where by coupling renewables and battery storage, we could defer traditional utility investment and in so doing um, save money and keep our bills low for our customers. Um, at the same time that we're driving these type of technologies within our system, technology is also driving um, big change in the transportation in industry. More and more electric vehicles are coming to market, vehicle range is increasing, fast charging times are reducing, and industry analysts now think by, that by 2040, over 60% of the new vehicles sold in this country um, will be electric. Um, today, there are only 6,000 electric vehicles in New York City, and um, for a city this large, I, I, I like to joke around, you know, we have more raised pizzas than, than, than that. Um, that. There is tremendous opportunity for growth, and New York City is so well suited for electric vehicles because we have many large fleets, we have relatively short commutes for many of, of um, the people who work here, and it helps address the fact that we need to have an essential focus on local air emissions. We're, we all maintain focus on reducing carbon emissions, but local air emissions for such a densely populated city as ours is also very important. Um, to help um, prepare and, and encourage more electric vehicle adoption, we've recently proposed a $25 million project that would test strategies for how can we best encourage employ, um, citizens to adopt electric vehicles. We're working with that on the New York, with New York City and looking if we can find the locations either both either on company facilities to get it kind of jump started, if you will, as well as on the street. We can provide electric vehicle charging stations that would help advance electrification of passenger vehicles, of taxis and trucks and fleets. Um, another element of our development, and it's, it's, it's amongst the most exciting things we're doing, is something called smart meters. Um, we are in, have just started a rollout of 5.4 million meters, smart meters, electric and gas, for every one of our customers um, that will take about the next five years. Um, customers will not only get better service, but they'll be able to access information, control their energy use. Um, in a much more engaging fashion and will be able to operate the grid more efficiently. Um, I, I, I don't use this word lightly. Uh, smart meters is a transformational project for our company and how we can meet our customers' needs and how we can provide new products and services. Um, now, a little bit on um, how our business works to enrich the communities we serve um, and provide a more sustainable environment. Um, first, we start at home. Uh, since 2005, we've been able to reduce our own carbon footprint by 48%. Um, that's roughly the equivalent of taking half a million cars off the road. Uh, we're proud of that, and we're working to continue to reduce it further going forward. Um, 
We've also worked to help our customers reduce their energy usage. Um, we are very strong advocates of energy efficiency programs, and we have rebates and incentives and programs for just about every type of customer. Since 2009, we've had 375,000 customers take advantage of those programs. They've received $350 million um, in rebates and incentives. And if you want to talk about an interesting business model, find another company that pays customers to use less of their product. That is, in effect, what we do because we know in the long run that's good for their customers, it's good to keep bills low, and it's the right thing for the environment. Um, as of uh, this summer, we had helped 6,500 large New York City buildings transition from oil to much cleaner burning natural gas. And that is one amongst many other reasons why New York City is now New Yorkers are breathing the cleanest air that they have in over 50 years. And when we look at natural gas, we see pretty clearly that demand for natural gas will continue to increase. It is the cleanest burning of the fossil fuels, and it is low cost. But we've recently worked with, um, with our staff and developed a proposal for how can we make better use of the natural gas supplies that we have. So we're recommending doubling the incentives for natural gas efficiently, kind of following the model that we've used with the electric system. And we're also looking at what, what is a relatively new term, non-pipeline alternatives. How can we take advantage of of the way customers are using natural gas now in a more efficient way so to avoid or defer the need for new gas pipeline bills. And while we may need new gas pipelines at some point, we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the existing resources we have as much as possible. Um, more directly in terms of community activity, um, we work hard to enhance the, um, the fabric of the communities we work in. We, Last year, we donated $12 million to nonprofits in areas that focus on education, the environment, the arts, civics, and the community. And our employees give of their own time as well. Um, we clean parks. We serve disadvantaged. We mentor students. Uh, we rehabilitate homes for veterans. We order career coaching. Um, that's just a few. We had over 250 volunteer activities last year, and our employees gave over 12,000 hours of volunteer hours just on our activities in addition to their own volunteer activities that they do uh, in their own communities. Um, just last month, our employees donated over $60,000 to those who were impacted by hurricanes. Um, the company matched that dollar for dollar as well as making substantial direct contributions to three of the major nonprofits who are helping support um, disaster relief. And that's in addition to the um, dispatch of our personnel, particularly who were particularly impactful in Florida. And I will tell you, when our, when our employees go on the road to help these areas, the, um, the role they're taking is, is something of heroic and something that we're all proud of to be able to reach out and help other communities when they're significantly affected. Um, when natural disasters strike, our people respond. Um, we're also very focused on STEM education. Um, one of our um, most interesting and, and really um, most impressive projects involves uh, the Energy Tech High School in Queens. This is a specific curriculum that we worked developed with uh, the New York City Department of Education and CCNY. It now offers a six-year program where, where students get a, a high school diploma and then can stay for two more years to get an associate's degree, all with a focus on energy technology and at no cost to the students. Um, we mentor students, we bring them to the company for internships, we help work and develop the curriculum, and the first graduating class from the first four years from the high school just graduated this past summer. Um, as compared to the citywide graduation rate of 67%, uh, Energy Tech had a graduation rate of 94%. And that's something that we think we can continue to maintain going forward. A lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm there in terms of building the future. Um, we have something called the STEM Day Out program where we bring thousands of middle, day, middle school students from around the country, to, around the city to different cultural institutions. And then the uh, partnership is with educators who really help to bring the exhibits to life. Um, not long ago, we had one of the groups at the American Museum of Natural History, and uh, one of the teachers said that in students who had never really been involved in science before are now captivated by it and really trying to understand how they can pursue careers like that. We think that's adding a, a real value for society. 
Um, I certainly want to make sure I also spend a little time on diversity and inclusion um, because we believe that it is absolutely crucial to long-term success uh, in the workplace, not only in our business, but in any business. Um, our view is that diversity across all categories of race, gender, culture, and experience is what makes our company strong. Um, we put a priority on recruiting and promoting women, veterans, and minorities across all of our businesses, across all the different aspects of our work, and we emphasize hiring women in non-traditional roles. Um, but we also view that the, the strength of diversity is really only unleashed if you have an inclusive environment. Uh, inclusion to us means that we make sure all voices are heard, all views are represented, everyone feels valued and respected in the, world, in the workplace and all ideas and experiences are welcomed. And we believe that's the road for us going forward that will lead to success. Um, so those are uh, kind of concludes my opening remarks. I hope I gave you a flavor for some of the things that we're working to achieve at Con Edison and how we're putting some of the philosophies and values that you hear at the New York Stern Center for Sustainability into practice. Um, I will tell you our experience has been that, that it is a real, true roadmap for success. Um, I wish all the students here um, that a a, that you have a wonderful intellectual experience here at Stern and that it leads to a fulfilling career and, and a rich life and livelihood. Um, thank you so much for having me. And Tansy, I, uh, I hope we have some opportunity for your questions and maybe to get questions from the group. Um, so let's get to them. Thank you. Thank you, Don. We have uh, three seats here if anybody wants them. So feel, feel free, and there's a couple of seats elsewhere, one here, a couple around, one over there. So please come on up. And we'll do a couple questions here, and then I want to make sure that we have questions for all of you, because I know you have a lot of them. So right. John, thank you so much. Uh, really inspiring talk. And I, I, um, I, Bruce, I, Bruce is my boss here. Bruce, I, you know, if I weren't working for you, maybe I'd try to get a job at Con Ed. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. So. Um, just to start, I think the, you started to talk about the, the smart metering program and the, the fact that you're going to take this out to 5.4 million people. You spent 1.4 billion on it. You're going to get a billion back to the customers, right? Um, what kind of change do you see coming about as a result of the installation of the smart meters? What does that mean, right? How, how does it happen? So, so this is a check. How much time do we have? Because <laughs> I could talk about smart meters. All. So first, $1.4 billion investment, capital investment on the part of the company um, will save customers a net the full business case of over a billion dollars. And that's the low estimate. That's only the things that we're firm on, not assuming that there's any change in customer uh, behaviors. 5.4 million meters electric and gas across our service territory. And I tell you transformational, and, and I am absolutely confident that that's the case. So I'll start at the simple thing. Yes, of course, for starters, we don't have to read your meter anymore. So no more people coming in for, for uh, homes or houses where you have to go in somebody's basement, you have to get into their kitchen, um, have to uh, be on their front lawn, don't have to do any of that, none of the inconvenience, none of the um, cost associated with that. That's a given. Um, Next is the ability to do remote turn-ons and turn-offs. So when somebody moves into a new apartment and wants to have their service established, which only happens a few zillion times in the city every year, right? Um, instead of making an appointment with us for us to come on and turn on your electricity, you set up your account either online or on the phone. We've, we verify that you're ready for electric service and we'll be able to turn it on remotely. Um, storm and, and outage response um, will be dramatically enhanced because we will no longer be responding when you tell us you have a power outage, but we'll know as soon as it happens. And because we'll be able to see the extent of the outage, whether it's three customers, 12 customers, 80 customers, we'll likely be able to, in most cases, diagnose what the problem is. It's this, it's this transformer, it's this feeder, it's this fused cutout and dispatch the right crew with the right equipment to, to repair it um, in a shorter period of time than it has traditionally caused. And when you look at broader outages, like a super storm Standy or a super storm Irene, we believe it will be able to improve our restoration time by several days. And we say that not because we have a model that says that. We say it because utilities that have, had, uh, have already installed and benefited from smart meters have been able to see that type of improvement. Um, we'll be able to reduce electric usage, we think, by seven-tenths of a percent 
And, and a, little, a little less than 1% may not be impressive, but that's 1%, 24-7, 365 for every one of our customers going forward by controlling um, voltage more precisely and maintaining it more uh, narrowly in exactly the areas that are needed to provide uh, reliable service for our customers. And we believe it will open the door to providing new products and services, um, probably some that we, we can't even think of right now, because this, this is like our version of big data. Um, this, this, this will allow us to know what's going on in the system, and, and as many um, industries have seen, um, once you have the data, you find ways to use it that you didn't expect, but, but ways that we know that we'll be able to use it would be along the lines of um, looking at and helping customers manage their usage more effectively. So we'll be able to, to write a letter that says, um, Dear Ms. Smith, um, just want to let you know, as far as we can tell, you live in a single family, 1960 vintage home. Most of the houses on your block are just about the same as yours. You use 43% more electricity than the average of your neighbors. If you're interested, we have energy efficiency consultants. We can refer you to other companies that provide this type of energy efficiency. Or these are the type of things you might look at yourself if you want to start checking into why that's the case. Um, and we can see that actually that your refrigerator goes on like three times every 10 minutes. So unless you're running a bodega there, does, you probably need a new refrigerator. Here are some energy efficient models. Here's what they would cost. Here would be the payback period. And here's a, a, a um, qualified vendor that you could call or list of vendors to have them come in and do the replacement for you. Um, a, a very different type of relationship that we can have with our customers around helping them manage their, en their energy use and reduce costs in a much more proactive, much more engaged way. So a lot to be excited about with, with smart meters. And just to stay on technology for a minute, you um, mentioned as well that you're hoping to use this to help uh, with the sort of smart cities movement, that there's ways that you could use this around security, around weather, around, I wonder if you could tell us what some of the possible opportunities could be. Yes, so um, first to frame this a little bit, we are not the first doing smart meters, um, not even close, about 40% of the country already has smart meters. Um, but we're benefiting from, because for in a number of ways. One, we're getting second generation smart meters and actually at less than first generation prices. And we're able to look forward and build a system that will not only be able to support smart meters, but likely be able to support many other uses as well. So we're building out our own communication network that, that communicates with the meters. And we can see, none of this is actually firmly in the plans yet, but we've built it and sized it so that it can support many smart city type activities. So um, traffic control and congestion, instead of having traffic lights that go on and off based on time, we can set up algorithms that go that, and with the proper sensors in the street that know how many cars are. We can control traffic lights based on what cars need to move and where is the most traffic. Um, we can, uh, from a security perspective, there are sensors available relatively low cost that can, can detect the sound of a gunshot and immediately notify police of a security incident so they can respond immediately instead of when um, they get a phone call. Um, control of street lights, um, clearly one that would be uh, another aspect that, um, and, and some cities are already doing that and taking advantage um, that in a way that maximizes their effectiveness but minimizes their cost and usage. And so by taking advantage of our communications network, we can not only provide really new intelligence um, and new innovation for electric and gas customers, but really overall for the communities we serve. Great. Thank you. So beyond the technology, when you look 10 years out, I mean, there's, well, so many different changes happening in the energy sector. So what does the Con Edison of 10 years from now look like? Yeah. <laughs> I, I will tell you, it's very different from, from what it looks like now. Um, and, uh, and, and all changes that we're very much looking forward to, and we see, we see frankly, as a, as a business and as a service provider, great, great opportunity. Um, our role will continue to grow as an enabler of new technologies. So a lot of this distributed energy resources, um, uh, such as uh, rooftop solar, fuel cells in some cases, battery storage, electric vehicles, these, these are all technologies that were not quite commercial five or 10 years ago in most cases, and then now are commercial and might either break even or cost beneficial or pretty close to being able to do it. And the price curves all show that they're gonna break through in, in, depending on which one you pick in the next three to five years. 
we have a very significant role in enabling those technologies, making it easy to get a solar connection, helping provide the control so that electric vehicles are charged at the right time so that they don't negatively affect the system by creating new peak usage and so the customers can charge them at the, at the time of lowest cost so they can minimize, if you will, their, their refueling cost. Um, very much our distribution system, which used to be uh, a way to just pr to provide electricity to the customer, now becomes a two-way flow. Um, where we're taking in distributed energy resources, and it becomes the, um, the center of the system. Frankly, historically, the center of the system was the power plants and the transmission system. They now become one of the feeds in, but the distribution system becomes um, kind of the essential part that allows all these new technologies uh, to be a bigger part. Uh, solar and wind and other renewables clearly will be a much more significant factor. We, are, we have city goals, we have state goals, um, the most significant for New York, for New York State is, is likely the 50 by 30 goal. By 2030, 50% of our electricity has to come from renewable resources. So we're at 25% now. So you say, oh, not too bad, we're halfway there. Except that 20% of that 25% is legacy hydro, hydro that was built 60 and 70 years ago. So with 15 years of new renewables, we've moved the, the, the needle about 5%. And so in the next 13 years, we have to move it another 25%. And that's primarily going to require large-scale renewables, large projects um, that will likely be um, northern New York, western New York, and offshore. And then in addition to requiring those large-scale renewables, we'll need to have electric transmission to bring the power from those less populated areas to the load centers like uh, New York City, the lower Hudson Valley, and Long Island. Um, where the, the largest amount of, of uh, energy is used. And when we um, look at, at large-scale renewables, um, and, and don't mean this in a way to um, not support rooftop solar, because we do report rooftop solar. In fact, we have a rooftop solar company. Um, but when you look at, to be able to move the needle from 25% to 50%, large-scale renewables is about half the cost of rooftop solar. And so what we're looking to, to find opportunities is to develop our clean energy economy, but to do it in a way that's the lowest cost for our customers. Thank you. So you mentioned earlier that the Con Ed team has got, went down to Florida to help with the aftermath of the hurricane. Uh, we had quite a challenge here with Sandy, and as we look forward, we know that due to climate change, our weather events are going to be more extreme, and we're going to have more challenges like Sandy in New York. How is Con Ed planning to assist the resiliency of the city around its energy right source? And, and you know, what, what are the what, what's the future there? Yeah. So a, a little bit of a, a quick look back at Sandy and uh, how the system was designed and, w and where we're headed going forward. Um, we had a, a um, built the, the electric system traditionally based on the most significant flooding at the battery that has had, had ever been recorded in New York. And it dated back to a hurricane in the 1820s where the, the um, uh, sea level at the, at, the, at the battery reached 11.1 feet. So we had designed our system for 12 and a half feet, about a foot and a half of buffer to protect against that. And, and it was a good number that stood up for almost 100 years. Sandy came in at 14.1 feet three feet higher than had ever been seen in recorded history in New York City. So um, once the floodwaters have receded and we had all the electric and gas back on, um, we quickly started working on um, where do we take this? How do we um, enhance the resiliency of the system? And um, we quickly concluded that this was not something we should do in isolation. We should do it along with New York City and the appropriate building and standards department. We should do it with climate change experts and intellectuals from academia. Um, and we should do it with many of the, the large building owners and other infra agencies that operate infrastructure because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to build to whatever X number of feet we have to build to keep the electricity on but every large building's basement is flooded and that's where all their electrical equipment is and so they have to be out of service anyway. So we did it as a collaborative, um, as those things when you, when you involve a lot of different parties, it takes a little longer that way. But we were able to come up with the design criteria which basically takes the FEMA flood maps which were all renewed after Sandy for the 100 year flood and adds three feet to them. 
And so that is our current design criteria. We've, we and, and the city have agreed to that. And we have, we have completed, absent one project, we completed like 153 projects, one left to go, um, that take our system to that design criteria. Um, the way we've done it, um, I think, is important too. Um, by the way, that overall program, over a billion dollars in storm hardening and resiliency efforts, so a very sig significant investment. Um, wherever possible, well, let me step back for a second. A number of ways of going around making your system more resilient. You, you can take whatever equipment you're trying to protect and build walls around it. And by the way, that's, that's quick and cheap. And so the first, the first um, uh, season after Sandy, we were building walls around everything. I used to joke around, if you stood still in a substation for too long, there'd be a wall built around you. Um, um, quick and cheap and easy. We worked with wherever we were doing it to make it so that you could continue to build in the future up so that if we see climate change continues to progress, you don't have to tear it down and build the next wall, but you can build higher. That's kind of a crude but cheap and quick way of doing it. Um, the more sophisticated way of doing it, it is, is either removing the equipment anywhere from close to the floodplain. That's often not the case and not possible, particularly with our system being underground for most of our service territory. Um, and so the next uh, technique that we've worked hard to use is to make things submersible. Um, and the, the, the beauty of submersible, being submersible um, is that it, you don't have to be right with your prediction of what the flood height is. Um, if, it's, if it's submersible for 16 feet or 18 feet or 20 feet, it's going to survive either way. And it's submersible for other types of events like water main breaks, which do happen in, from time to time. And so. Um, with uh, the approaches we've used, I'm describing mostly the, the flooding concerns. We had similar issues around the overhead system in primarily in Westchester and Staten Island that was affected by high winds. Um, there, too, we used a number of approaches, stronger poles, stronger wire, quick disconnects that allow um, um, service connections to disconnect quickly, but restoration to happen much more quickly. The end result is you don't take the pole down when the wire comes down. Um, and when you look at how we've implemented these changes, um, we've tried to make them so that they benefit customers, not just when the next big storm happens, but that they benefit on regulatively normal weather type conditions. We estimate that we've avoided 250,000 customer outages over the last several years as a result of our post-Sandy storm hardening. And we see that there's opportunities to continue to enhance that going forward. Impressive. And as New Yorker, glad to hear it. <laughs> So one last question, I'm going to open it up. Uh, so as a Stern alum and somebody who's done well in his career, what kind of advice can you give to students here about how to move forward in their career and particularly how to find a path to where they can make a contribution around sustainability? So uh, I'll, take, I'll take the first a little bit. Um, and, and yeah, I'm, first, I've been incredibly fortunate in my career. I have been helped um, by many company employees, virtually every area I've gone. I've gotten the opportunity to have a very broad career and work in all different parts of operations, from power plants to substations to control centers. Um, and uh, the, the benefit of um, having received others' experience and knowledge is something without which I wouldn't have gotten anywhere close to what I've done. So I'm tremendously appreciative. Um, what I've seen in, in, in our company, and I kind of believe it's largely transferable, that there, there is, there's a couple of things that are um, a part of um, what often leads to the success. None of this will be any surprise to you. Um, the first is you got to work hard. Um, and you, and you, working hard not only means um, applying yourself and your resources, um, it means doing your share of the department's work. It means um, I like to use the word relentless um, because uh, you'll hit, in everything you, you're charged with doing, you will hit roadblocks, you will hit obstacles, and it's easy to pull up and say, it looks like this isn't working. Um, the people who really uh, deliver for us and some of the most successful leaders are, are really relentless. They, they find a way. They, above, below, around, they will get through every obstacle. Um, and I want to be careful here. Relentless sounds an awful li lot like ruthless. Um, no, <laughs> no, ruthless has no place in this. I'm talking about a persistence and a tenacity that you're going to find a way um, to make it happen and that you're committed to uh, achieving your goals or the, or the organization's goals. Um, second is being a team player. 
there is very little that happens in my company that is of any substantial importance that is done by a single individual. It is almost all a team effort. Our work is so complex, the service territory, territory we serve is so challenging and that the nature of, of the technology is such that you need to have many people working on it to really deliver good outcomes. So you, you've got to learn how to be a team player, how to contribute, how to lead sometimes, how to follow sometimes, how to work well with others. Um, often called emotional intelligence um, in, in many aspects of, um, uh, of uh, uh, workplace uh, psychology. Uh, but I'll tell you, it, it makes all the difference um, it, w when you can um, really find a way to engage and communicate and work well with others. Um, I have a, a good friend who um, worked at a place maybe many of you might not have ever heard of called Bell Labs. It was the, innovations, the innovation center of, um, of the world, frankly, for many years, not too far from here in Jersey. He worked there, worked on the first solar panels a few decades ago. And, um, and they were known for um, having amongst the brightest people um, on the planet. And he used to, he was a PhD himself, and he used to say, you know, PhDs are a dime a dozen. I need people who can work with each other. Um, so um, I think that, that has a lot of applicability. Um, and third, um, uh, be a person of integrity. Uh, ethics and integrity are, are something that uh, we, we can teach you the business. We, we, you, you can learn the financial side, the legal side, the regulatory side, the operational side, and, and we have all the tools available. Um, but um, how you approach your job, your responsibility, your sense of, of um, responsibility to the community and to others, um, the sense, uh, and, and by integrity, you know, this, the, we're not just talking about, you know, don't lie, cheat, or steal. We're talking about standing up for what's right, having the, um, having the conviction of your principles to know what, what is and what is not proper, and helping yourself and your organization um, drive in that direction. Um, towards sustainability, um, and we've, we've already touched on a good number of different topics. I guess one suggestion I'd have is think of sustainability in, in very broad perspective. It's, it's not just about the environment. It's not just about having a business model that's going to be able to, to stand up um, and be successful in 10 or 20 years. Um, it, it's about public service. It is about integrity and ethics. It's about proper governance of the organization. Um, think of it in, in the broadest, broadest perspective and, um, and find a company that, al that aligns with your values and where you think um, what you'd like to accomplish is something that they, they're already working to accomplish because that's really satisfying, right? I mean, you, you can tell I like Con Ed a little bit, right? Um, I, you know, and it started off because I love big equipment. I, 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 you know, as a kid, I used to work on cars and, and do tune-ups and oil changes and all that, all the simple stuff, by the way, none, none of the tough stuff. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to learn, you know, I found that they had, you know, they had even bigger machinery. They have big turbines and generators and nuclear reactors. Oh, it's all really interesting. Um, and so I wanted to, to have the opportunity to do that. Um, and I did, and it had all that. But I stayed because of the people. Um, the people are just fantastic. Um, they, they, they care about what they do. They are sharing of their information. And this, this applies 37 years ago when I started and applies today. Um, they care about what we do. Um, if you were um, to, to take a, a sampling of our employees and you were to ask them um, what's our PE ratio, um, what's our current dividend payout ratio, how does it compare to our peers, unless you're talking to the finance department, you're going to get blank stares. Um, if you were to ask them what our safety record is, what our customer service scores are, and what our reliability record is, They'll write it off right, like, like that because that's, that's, that's what makes the job real to us. That's what we care about. And, and of course, you know, we're, we, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders, so you can't be flipping about it. But fundamentally, when we do what's right for our customers, we'll eventually be right for our shareholders. Okay. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you. We have questions. We have one right there. And please use the microphone because we're recording this. I recently, I recently had the pleasure of being at Regeneron to see their net zero garage in Terrytown. 
And I just wondered your thoughts on like public-private partnerships, if I'm correct, I think kind of played a role. You know, they have solar panels and they have rainwater, barrels, it's really kind of a unique model that then could even be taken to local government and done in towns where they have parking issues. And it's just sort of interesting like, how ConEd has a role very much in Westchester County to kind of activate that. So I don't know if you want to talk about this best case practice, what do you think? Yeah, and it, it falls in line with something I mentioned quickly earlier, our role in enabling new technologies and innovation. In some cases, we'll be an owner, a part owner or a complete owner. In some cases, we won't own any of it, but we're just helping the customers find a way to do it. Frankly, be, developing projects like that or even something that may sound as simple as, uh, you know, like the Morgan Stanley building wants to put in fuel cells so that they have some on-site generation to keep their data centers up and running. Um, that is not an easy task to do. The regulatory issues, the permitting within the city, and the interconnection, and uh, that alone is very challenging. And then when you try and come to a point, well, how do I optimize this from a, a business case model? Um, they're often not fully aware of the different incentives and rebates. They're not aware of the, the there, there is a marketplace for electricity that operates and clears every six minutes. Um, very few, few typical customers know how to play in that market. How do they align? How do you bid in? Um, what's the strategy that you would want to, how do you size your project so that you can get the maximum capacity and energy payments from that market, um, but minimize the chance that you won't get picked up? Um, those are all things that most companies, even big companies like a mortgage center, don't spend a whole lot of time on. Um, we have, that's what we do for a living. We, we know, and so in some ways we can just enable the projects by working in partnership with the organization. Some cases there's a lot of opportunity for us to do it with the, with the local municipality as well. I and mean, what we're doing with the city of New York on EV charging stations is, is a good example. The whole plan that we're laying out is something that is the, the result of the collaboration between us and city planners and certainly City planners have a very different perspective on, on uh, economic development and population growth in the city that we do. We, have no, we don't have that expertise. Um, so you put the two together and you end up, <clears throat> I think, in almost all cases with a much better pro product. So we see that as being a big part of our role going forward. Question over here. And uh, if you can use the, the, the mic. On. On. The mics aren't working. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Oh, Thanks. Thanks. Uh, It is, it is working? Okay. I'm curious if Con Ed has or is considering taking a position on the current administration's actions uh, regarding the regulations around auto emissions. So um, <coughs> when uh, various regulations are put out, proposed regulations, city, state, federal, um, we look at them, we try and understand what the potential impacts are to our customers and to our business. Because um, there are often, um, we, we find cases where the, the cost impacts are not fully evaluated or, or we don't agree with, with the cost impacts we see them be. Um, and where there are unintended consequences. Um, we don't tend to take positions on what is the best social policy. And if you will, no one elected us. There's a lot of different ways to pursue um, environmental improvements, economic development of, of, um, of different areas. And so we haven't self-appointed ourselves either. We want to make sure it's a fully informed decision. We want to ensure that there are the, if there are unintended consequences that, they, that they're understood. Um, but we don't specifically take a position of, you know, you sh we should be doing what France is doing and outlawing um, uh, internal combustion engines by 2040. We don't tend to go that far. We think that's best left. Um, to um, the electorate and to elected officials who are more directly connected with what society wants. Question over here. Um, sorry, I wanted to have the students. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, you touched on uh, what were we talking? battery storage a few minutes ago, and I'd love to get your thoughts on lithium ion and the future of that. Last year, the fire department came out with some safety concerns about residential lithium ion, um, and I'm wondering if Con Ed shares those, those concerns, and if you do, what are some of the alternatives that you're exploring, like maybe vanadium redox, that kind of stuff? 
Yeah, so w we are looking at all the alternatives. We think lithium ion is likely the technology for the foreseeable future, the, the seven to 10 years. The fire department of New York is probably the most proficient professional fire department in the country. They have the most challenging service territory and they have driven down the incident and number of, of injuries and fatalities due to fires dramatically over the last several decades. And we have tremendous respect to them. We are working very closely with them on the permitting of lithium-ion. They are very cautious, they are very careful. They don't take it at face value. We, we are in fact literally involved in a significant testing activity with them around lithium-ion batteries to uh, take their criteria and see if the batteries that are commercially available. So it, it takes longer um, to work through Fire Department of the City of New York problem than anywhere else we know. Um, but we, we, we think it's the right thing to do, and we will get there. And we, I don't think we're too far off from having permittable lithium-ion batteries. It may not be what everyone expects. Right? It, the, the, the idea of a power pack on your garage wall, um, that, that's probably a ways off because it's directly ad adhered to a combustible surface. Um, you know, they'd like it to be 20 feet away. Of course, the, you, there's no place in, you know, in Queens Village that is 20 feet away from, from a combustible <laughs> surface. So, yeah, yeah, th there is a give and take. But um, lithium ion, likely the technology for the foreseeable future. And the fire department, I think, is doing the right thing, and we're going to get there. Questions? Yes, here, and then we'll have one back there. Uh, I'm Dr. Rahm from the medical school, and thanks for support for research on asbestosis and lung cancer screening. Right. Uh, my question is, toward 2050, we're going to have to have deep decarbonization, and you're going to have all this renewable energy coming in from offshore, wind, and what have you, and it's all coming in in New York, and you have three business challenges. You've got to get us off our gas stoves and onto electric stoves, and how are you going to do that? Uh, we're going from oil to gas heating. How are we going to get off gas to electric heating in all our apartment buildings and office towers? And third, we have renegades. Uh, renegades are uh, entities that build their cogeneration plants and get off Con Ed and have their own heat and light. Uh, I don't want to mention the renegades, but NYU is a big one. And uh, so how are you going to... Uh, Wrap, uh, wrap your arms around us. Yeah. <laughs> so really great question. Um, <laughs> lots there. Let me start with NYU. No, 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 no. <laughs> so um, the, 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 the 80 by 50 challenge, 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050 for um, New York City and New York State is a tremendous challenge. We've done the studies to say, is it even feasible? And the answer is yes. Um, but it requires a significant reduction, as you pointed out, in use of natural gas for space heating and, um, and electric production, and a significant reduction in um, uh, emissions related to transportation, cars and trucks, primarily. It, it, is, it is a very, now it, you know, it's 33 years away, so you don't want to put off a challenge like this, but we do have some time, and there will continue to be um, techno technology innovation that will help us do this. But if, if we um, want to make that march, it is doable. Um, the cost impacts have not been fully scoped out. If, if you were to take a building like this and convert it to electric heating, um, the costs are quite substantial. Not so much for the kind of infrastructure, for the building infrastructure. Um, because it's, it's different type systems and you have to increase not only, not only do you have to change out um, from boilers to heat pumps, um, but you have to increase the size of your electric service because you're, you're, you're powering up much more equipment. Um, so there's a lot of challenges and it's a good thing we got three decades to work on it. We see it though that, that it's, it's doable and it's, um, um, and it's something we can achieve. The cost will be significant. Um, I didn't mention energy efficiency. Getting to 80 by 50, energy efficiency is a big part of it. If, if you were to list um, 
solar, wind, hydro, battery storage, electric vehicles, and energy efficiency, and which one makes the biggest difference? Almost every case, energy efficiency is the top. It is not quite as, as sexy as, as solar and, and wind, but it is almost always the most effective way to reduce emissions and the lowest cost way to reduce emissions and to re reduce customer bills. So we continue to be a massive advocate and the amount of energy efficiency we'll need to reach 80 by 50 is very significant as well. So all the things you bring up, those are all things that will have to be addressed. Technically it's feasible. There's gonna be a whole lot of policy challenges. There'll be codes and standards that have to change and there'll have to be a commitment that we're willing to, to pay the bill at the end of the day. And Con Ed was a partner with NYU on the CoGen. I mean, you, we worked with you a bit on the CoGen, right? We did. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of we were an enabler. Yeah, um, it's, you were sort it's, of enabler. it's all your project. We made sure it was connected yeah. and you sized it right and, and um, yeah. that the service was as optimized as possible. Great. Thank you. There was a question over here. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for being here today. Um, I think of utilities sometimes as kind of a mirror and their energy uses are just kind of a mirror of the population and their, their preferences and, you know, kind of with, you know, maybe with legislation leaning one way or another, setting goals. Um, how do you, in the utility sector, what about other utilities that maybe don't have that policy, you know, requirements leaning on them? Is there a really strong business case right now just across the board for every utility to, you know, increase energy efficiency? Like how? How do we kind of move beyond just kind of talking about doing things in the right way as like a, you know, a virtuous thing to do and also be how do we make that business case in the utility sector? Yeah, so you know, when you look at, at the different service territories across the country um, and, and realize the economics in those service territories are often vastly different, the culture is vastly different. I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, up until last year, 2016, coal was the leading source of fuel for electric generation in this country. Natural gas just, just exceeded it. But, but coal is still a third of the fuel used to burn, uh, to create electricity in this country. Um, in New York, we stopped burning coal, New York City, in the early 70s, um, over 40 years ago. We said coal doesn't work here. Um, it is still a very substantial... What drives that? A whole host of economic and social jobs related issues that, that permeate the, the different parts of the country. Um, energy efficiency um, is something that is very different in a densely populated um, city like ours as compared to um, uh, single family homes in, in more suburban and especially rural parts of the country. It shows up very differently. You know, any, New York City is already the most energy efficient city in the country. Um, and, and it's a combination of relatively small living spaces, <laughs> um, a, a lot of buildings with a lot of apartments, so losses are less because, you, you know, you, you got 26 um, apartments on a floor, but you only have the four walls uh, that, that surround it, and so losses are less. And because of the efficiency of mass transportation and in particularly um, the subway system. So we have a lot of those things that you go to a lot of other parts of the country and they're, they're not there. And it's part of why national energy policy, you know, we, we really do not have a national energy policy. We do not and have not um, uh, going back to the 70s. It's very hard to write the one set of rules that um, everyone can buy into. The clean power plan that was... Um, uh, put forth under the uh, Obama administration that now eventually is is um, uh, I don't I don't actually, I don't even know if it's been officially withdrawn but it's clearly it's 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 not going to be enacted um, uh, attempted to do that and even that did it at a relatively low level um, but getting a consensus across the country that you know Kentucky and New York should do the same thing it's that's pretty challenging stuff question. So um, we, I think of us having three lines of business, our regulated utilities, our renewables business, and our transmission business. Um, the regulated utilities are 90% or more of the company right now. But if you measure by revenues, by earnings, by number of employees, by investment in uh, assets, um, that is the overwhelming majority of the company, 90% or more. 
And it, th we might not be at the 90% more for the next 10 or 20 years, but that will still be the majority of the company. That's where our major investment is. That's where we put the largest part of our focus in terms of operation, um, optimizing our operations. Um, and it's where most of our investment goes. So for example, uh, in our regulated utilities, um, we'll invest $3.1 billion in new capital this year. Um, that's more than we've invested in renewables over the whole life of the renewables business. Um, it's hard for the renewables business to become a larger part of the business when you're investing $3.1 billion every year in your regulated utilities. So that's the biggest part. The renewables is clearly going to continue to grow significantly, um, and tax policy plays into this a, a bit as well. Um, the uncertainty around tax policy makes it so that it's it, in some of the renewable projects, it's harder to be certain. These are, these are long-term investments, 20 or 25 years, typically um, contracted output outputs. Um, so you, you, you got to know what the economics are before you enter into a 20 or 25 year contract. The uncertainty around um, tax policy is slowing down investment in renewables. I view that that's kind of just holding our breath for a little while. Let, let this play out, find out what tax policy will be. That'll continue to be a major source of investment. And Con Ed Transmission, we, we see more as an opportunity. We have four or five projects either in, in service or um, uh, where we have bid on. Um, that will grow with the remote renewables business growing, uh, and we see that there'll be good opportunities there. Um, estimates that, that New York State, to meet 50 by 30, will need 1,000 miles of new electric transmission. Um, so that's 1,000 miles in 13 years. We've probably built about 40 miles in the last 13 years. So a very significant increase in investment. So that'll grow too. But I, I think if you go out five years, 10 years, 15 years, I, won't, I don't know if I'll try to go much further than that, our regulated utilities will be the overwhelming majority of our company. We'll take one last question from a student there. Yep. Uh, thanks again for coming. I was just curious, you mentioned earlier how investments in energy efficiency tend to reduce demand. And I'm curious if utilities are thinking about potential new revenue streams or they're just hoping that electric vehicles and other forms of electrifying transport are going to make up for that or they have to kind of reinvent their business model in some ways. Yeah, um, we, we are looking at new revenue streams. Um, so um, when, when Mrs. Smith buys that refrigerator and, and buys it from Joe's Heating and Air Conditioning, we're expecting, we're expecting the little piece of Joe's Air Conditioning's new business. Um, and and we, we will want to do that um, not only in the best interest of the company, but on the customer's behalf. When we find new opportunities like that, most of those revenues will flow right back to the customer because, frankly, you could argue the customer paid for the smart meter that's enabling the technology. They deserve the benefit of that. Part of how, in, in a low growth electric usage environment, and you're at, right on target as you described, is can we develop, define new revenue streams that will help keep customer bills low? And we see that there'll be op opportunities there and are, are pursuing them. Great. John, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And congratulations on all the great thank work you. of the My company. My pleasure to be here. Nice talking with all of you.